So uh, again, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, Baghdad, Cairo, and Libya, uh, and, and uh, go pretty rapidly through these three uh, instances. Um, uh, but I wanted to just start by uh, setting the questions that I'm going to talk about with regard to Baghdad, Cairo, and Libya in the larger context of the looting of archaeological sites and museums. Uh, we know that, that uh, archaeological sites and museums have long been the object of, uh, of looting uh, all the way back to uh, the most ancient of ancient histories. But uh, there we, we know, the, of course, about the Elgin marbles and the, um, the, the theft of antiquities during uh, the age of imperialism. Um, this was usually done by countries, uh, by armies, by militaries, uh, sometimes by individual collectors, uh, sometimes even by museums, but not as part of an organized trade that, uh, that involved what we would think of as, uh, as market mechanisms, dealers, uh, 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 middlemen, um, uh, suppliers, and then on, on the other end, uh, the, the, the demand side of, col uh, of a large number of collectors who are willing to put up uh, cash. Since the 1960s, we've seen a, a, a major change. That is to say, the emergence of a global market in antiquities. And there are a number of factors that have fueled this growth. But the three main, main ones, I think, are, are pretty clearly the democratization of wealth on, on the one hand. That is to say, uh, it used to be the case that there was a small number of very rich people, mostly in, uh, in the Western countries, who, who, who uh, uh, would buy the very most exquisite uh, items. And now, uh, there are millionaires all over the world, um, and uh, there is a global demand for, for antiquities, and there are also just a lot more people who have disposable income who are, w are willing to buy pieces in the, say, $500 to $2,000 range. Uh, along with that uh, uh, is the emergence of technologies that allow uh, looters to communicate with uh, dealers and, um, and through the dealers to communicate often directly with purchasers by going onto the uh, sites uh, where looters are operating, snapping a cell phone picture, uploading it to the internet, uh, it gets sent on to the collector who says, yes, I want this. And then the smuggling uh, can go on by putting it on board a jet plane. And within 24 hours, it's arrived from uh, the Middle East in, in Tokyo or in Brussels or, or wherever. Um, and last but not least, and this is actually since the 1980s, the emergence of, uh, of a new component of the market demand for antiquities is the segment of the market that decides it wants to collect these things, not because they're beautiful, not because they appeal to their sense of national identity, uh, but because they are a, a good place to park money. Uh, they're a safe investment that is unlikely to go down in price. It's not, they're not as volatile as, uh, as, uh, as the art market in general. And so uh, it's a speculative investment on the part of people. And, the more money you get into the system, the, 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 the more uh, uh, incentive there is going to be for looting. The result of this is that we're seeing heritage lost around the world. Um, these are some looter's pits in uh, Cambodia. Samuel Johnson once talked about taking a comprehensive view from China to Peru. And if you, uh, if you look at in China, there, you know that there's quite a bit of looting going on since the opening uh, after the Cultural Revolution, uh, but also in Peru. Um, you can find uh, uh, bones littering in the ground of looters' holes as well. So um, the, mar the, the, mar the emergence of a market is one factor that we have to think about if we're going to talk about why it's, it, uh, we're facing a, a, a crisis in loss of, the, uh, of our knowledge about the past caused by, an, uh, by looting. Uh, but the other side of this has to do with the, the ability of the to respond to um, the, the threats to its cultural patrimony that are, uh, that, that, that are represented by looting. Um, and we're, what we're seeing now is a weakening of, uh, of states uh, around the world, and that translates into more looting. It's not just a problem in the third world. We're now seeing, due to the economic crisis, that uh, museums and sites in Greece have been attacked uh, by looters in, in recent months because of the Greek e uh, economy going down the tube. Um, we know that. Uh, a British museum was looted recently, and they, the people went into the museum looking specifically for Chinese antiquities, uh, because the, the, the market for Chinese antiquities is so hot that it's led to looting of British museums that, that, are, that are containing Chinese antiquities. Um, so uh, uh, th that's the general uh, uh, picture. But 
Baghdad, Lib uh, Cairo, and Libya represent a, a more specialized case, and in some ways they represent a case that's easier for us to focus on, precisely because it's uh, it, the moving parts are, are, are in some ways you know fewer. Um, in all three of these cases, we're talking about a state that's not just weakened, and I say the, that there are not just fewer police than there normally are, but these are states that are in crisis, uh, and therefore uh, the, the the security function that the police is uh, that, that is normally there is is either you know sort of being pulled back or has been taken away altogether. Um, and so the question is, what happens to museums and archaeological sites in these kinds of situations? What can you do? to prevent looting in these particular kinds of situations uh, and, and uh, what kinds of policies uh, you know, should, we be, should we be trying to suggest to governments uh, uh, and to international organizations and to, to concerned citizens in these countries uh, who are worried about what's going to happen if, they're, if, they're, if their state breaks down. So Baghdad, Cairo, and Libya give us three uh, case studies that we can, we can talk about. I was, I'm going to start by talking about the lessons of Baghdad and then uh, as uh, James said earlier, these are spelled out in much more detail in the, these two volumes. So uh, if you're interested in, in, in really uh, following the story in, in great, greater detail, uh, you can take a look at these. So I'm, but I'm just going to walk you through what happened in the, uh, in the case of, of Baghdad. And then uh, we can talk, uh, I'm going to say a little bit about you know, wha uh, what the meaning of what, uh, 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 is of what happened. So, so in March 2003, Remember, the invasion occurred at the beginning of April of 2003. The United States invaded Iraq. So uh, uh, prior to the invasion, the Iraq archaeologists were very much aware of the possibility that the Iraq Museum would be threatened by looters. They were aware of this because when it, it, they, had a, they had a recent uh, uh, historical uh, uh, lesson from the 1990s when the United States established uh, no-fly zones in the north and the south of Iraq, and within 24 hours, nine out of the 13 regional museums in those areas were looted. They were looted because the Iraqi government no longer w uh, could fly helicopters around and, and monitor those areas, and the people in those areas knew that, and they, were, they took advantage of it and immediately uh, sacked these museums. Yeah? Um, uh, the archaeologists uh, and the museum director uh, at the Iraq Museum uh, went to a, a meeting uh, in January of 2003 and presented this uh, as, uh, you know, as a scenario uh, that, the, you know, that, the, the, that uh, what would happen if the state collapsed and shouldn't we, shouldn't we be uh, uh, starting to pack up this stuff because the Americans really sound like they're going to attack us. Uh, and they were told, no, there's no need to pack away uh, anything because Saddam would never allow the Americans to go into Baghdad. And that was the position of the Iraqi government up until three weeks before the invasion when uh, somebody came over to the museum and said, don't tell anybody, but go, go ahead and start packing stuff up. And they did pack up a lot of stuff and moved it, moved it away for safekeeping. So you can see here, uh, this is a, one of the, uh, uh, the cases that they, they packed uh, artifacts in. Um, at the same time, there were other last-minute steps that were being taken by archaeologists outside of Iraq who were also very much aware that there was a threat to Iraq's heritage. Um, one of the things that the uh, archaeologists in the United States and Great Britain did was to provide the U.S. military and the, their British counterparts with a list of coordinates of archaeological sites so that they could, these sites' coordinates could be loaded into the, uh, the computers as a, what's called a no-strike list, that is to say, these are, these are um, areas that are off limits to bombing and off limits to tanks driving through. So the, uh, and this is something that, um, that they were asked to do by the militaries in Great Britain and the United States, and they did do that. Um, at the same time, the Archaeological uh, Institute of America and other uh, archaeological associations um, in the West uh, it wrote op-ed pieces and wrote letters to the uh, to the to, to the uh, Pentagon, uh, you know, sort of reminding them that they needed to take care of these things, and there that there was a, that, that this was a cradle of civilization, and they should uh, that, uh, that looting was going to be likely to happen. Um, so they did that, and uh, a couple of other things at the very last minute happened. A uh, U.S. diplomat went traveled to uh, uh, Jordan, convinced the King of Jordan to 
that, uh, to say it would be okay to take the contents of the museum in Baghdad and move it to Jordan if, if the Iraqis would say yes. And then this diplomat uh, went to Baghdad and asked the uh, foreign minister if, they, if that would be okay. And this is two weeks before the invasion. And of course, it's a crazy time to be asking somebody this because you're, you're coming from a country that's about to attack them. And you're saying, would you mind if we take your stuff and move it to this other country? And if, so he was told to go away and nothing came of that. Um, the, the, other, the other interesting little story uh, vignette is that an Iraqi American uh, security expert um, who, who had made his living actually providing security for American archaeological digs in Iraq uh, for many, many years, um, tra traveled to Iraq about a, a, a few weeks before the uh, invasion just to see a new, a new site that had been uh, just recently discovered. And he, saw, he ran across a guard there and he said, so what are you going to do when the war starts? And the guard, guard said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, they're going to come for you and they're going to come with guns and they're going to drive you off and they're going to loot the site. Uh, and, the, and the guard said, well, I don't, have any, I don't have a weapon, so what can I do? So this guy went into, into Baghdad and bought, bought the guard an AK-47 rifle and gave him the rifle. Okay? And that guard actually did use the rifle to, to he got into a shoot, shooting uh, match with the looters who did come eventually and he did, dry, he did keep them from driving them off the site. Okay, so then the war starts in April. Just as it's starting, the uh, uh, Iraqis uh, who are in the museum are, uh, uh, by the way, the, the Iraqi government a week before the war started deputized all the curators in the museum and the archaeologists who worked there and gave them guns and, 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 uh, and, and uh, uniforms and told them they, 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 were now, they were now soldiers and not just curators. Uh, and then as, as soon as the war started, the, the, those the Iraqi uh, security forces uh, vanished. And the archaeologists took off their, took off their <laughs> uniforms and threw their weapons down because they weren't about to, to you know, to, to fight against the the Americans on on, on those grounds. But uh, the Iraqis uh, did establish these um, firing areas on the grounds at the museum, which is against the laws of war. Uh, here's another another shot. Um, uh, the Americans um, came into Baghdad. You'll you'll recall there was very little resistance, but there were there was some some fighting, um, and at, at one point the uh, Americans approached the, uh, the museum and were fired on by a sniper who was in, uh, in a window up here, and you can see what happened to the sniper uh, by that hole in the window. Uh, but uh, at, at after, after firing at the sniper, uh, the Americans did not uh, then attack the grounds of the museum, which they, they could have done, but that would have been a real publicity disaster. Instead, they, they just pulled back, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, about 500 yards away from the museum, but out of sight of where the museum was. So the museum at that point was uh, left uh, uh, without any, uh, any American eyes on it and, and without any um, Iraqi uh, military uh, on the grounds anymore because they, they also fled from the museum. Uh, the museum director had, had holed up in the museum at this, uh, before the, when the war started, he had let everybody else the staff go except for a few people who chose to remain behind uh, and they, they, they stayed there until the fighting started at the museum uh, uh, and they saw soldiers running around on the grounds and at that point they, they decided that they didn't want to be uh, in the middle of a shooting uh, a war and they, and they left the museum. Um, what happened next was that a crowd of people uh, broke in to, through a small door in the back of the museum and then thousands of, pe uh, thousands of people followed them in and went rampaging through the through this museum, which is, I it's I, I just I, I hope it's clear, the ba Iraqi National Museum is the repository of uh, of most of uh, of the best um, uh, excavated material from archaeological sites in uh, the the Fertile Crescent, which is normally thought of as the birthplace of civilization. So this is a you know one of the world's great museums. And it's, it's, uh, it was, it, it was uh, open season. People ran, went running through. They broke, th they broke into the offices, stole the typewriters, stole everything that wasn't tied down, and, um, uh, and, and ransacked the offices, threw all the files on the floor so nobody could make any sense. Uh, and this turned out to be a very, very serious problem because the Iraqis had never computerized their records. 
since they had been under uh, sanctions since 1991, uh, uh, that meant they never got computer, modern computer equipment. And they were, so, so when these records were destroyed, it made it almost impossible for them to figure out what, what had been stolen and what hadn't been stolen. It took a long time to put that back together. The looters uh, tore things off the walls. Uh, they broke display cases. Uh, but one of the things you need to notice about this picture, it's, it's important. This, this was one of the pictures that went around the world and everybody said how horrible it was that the museum was looted. But if you actually look over behind the, the broken one, the very dramatic foreground, you see there's all these other <laughs> display cases that are, that are not broken but are empty. And they're empty because the Iraqis actually uh, did, did pack up most of the stuff that was out in the public areas. Everything that they, they had time to and that they could, they, they, they packed. So there wasn't that much looted from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, in terms of small portable things. Uh, there were some things, however, that they could, the Iraqis couldn't pack up, including um, uh, one of the most important pieces, the uh, a vase that shows uh, really the first religious ceremony ever uh, depicted on, uh, 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 by, uh, by, uh, in any artifact. And that was on top of this pedestal. And so the, uh, the, the thieves came in and just chiseled, chiseled that off and they also chiseled off the heads of, um, of, these, of one of these lions, the Syrian lions. Um, there, were, there were several different kinds of looters, by the way. There were, there were people who were, who were just walking, you know, walking around looting all the buildings and saw that the museum was open and rushed in and tried to grab whatever they could. There were some people in the crowd who, were com who came in with the, with, with the mob but came in in order to take things because they wanted to, to give them back and they were trying to save things. Uh, and then there was a third group of looters uh, who, who were the, uh, the, the professional looters. And these were guys that, that uh, the museum director and many people who worked at the museum believe uh, had cased, you know what the word cased means? It mean, you know, they, they'd gone to the museum before the invasion and, and, uh, or had somebody inside the museum uh, tell them where the good stuff was. Uh, so that they could, you know, they could plan to go there when, when the opportunity arose. And these people went right through the main galleries. They went to a stairwell that had, uh, that had a, uh, a, a, a cement wall in front of it. Now this wall actually had just been cemented. Uh, it was actually a doorway that, they, that the museum director had ordered them to, to turn into a wall so that people would not realize that there was a stairwell that went down to the basement where the storerooms were. And these guys knew that this was, uh, somehow knew that this was not just a wall and they broke through it, went down to the basement and, and grabbed stuff from, went to the storerooms where, where, the, uh, where, where among other things there were these um, cylinder seals. Now, cylinder seals are, are probably the most valuable per ounce um, artifacts in the world. It says here one of them sold for $424,000, that's in 2001. So, so these are, and they're about the size of my finger. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so, so they're very, very easy to, to, to carry. So a bag full could be worth, you know, could be worth several million dollars. And they, they grabbed a couple of bags of these. Um, uh, and so that was one of the major losses. Uh, you can see, by the way, how beautiful the, the, the reason collectors want them is that you roll them in, in wet clay. Originally they were kind of signatures, but they, they, they were incised with these designs that would then uh, appear uh, uh, on the wet clay, and uh, collectors are, are crazy for these kinds of things. So uh, while that was happening, um, uh, the, the, the museum director, a guy named Donnie George, who's a real hero, uh, uh, he and the, the head of the Antiquities Bureau um, had gone to their family's houses, and they heard on the BBC radio that the museum was being looted. So they immediately went, uh, made their way as, fa as, as quickly as they could, given there's a war zone, um, to the Marine headquarters. And they begged them to, to give them some help uh, and told them that the museum was looted and asked them to send forces over there. And they got, they got this um, lieutenant colonel to write them a note which says, um, you know, these are co these are, they're cooperating with the coalition forces. Please allow them to pass through uh, security checkpoints without delay and, and to allow them to get back to the museum. And the, the, the same Marine colonel said, you get to the museum as fast as you can. We'll probably be there before you get there. It did take them five hours to get to the museum. 
uh, because they were stopped all along the way. Uh, but it took the American forces three days to get there. In the meantime, the director of the museum um, uh, and, and, a, and a few other employees who, who also showed up um, were left to uh, stand guard while thousands of people and, and guys in cars brandishing rifles would drive by and yell, we're coming back, you know, we're going to come back and finish the job. So they, had, they, they were standing out there with these metal, uh, metal rods to beat off people who, who might get in. This is, this is how they stopped further looting from, from happening during this time. So the Marines finally arrived uh, after three more days. Um, 15,000 items, more or less, were, were, were taken. Uh, and uh, there were uh, uh, amnesties uh, offered, and uh, the uh, religious authorities were told to preach, to tell people to bring things back. Uh, there were sort of uh, efforts by um, people like this Marine Colonel Matthew Bogdanos um, uh, to uh, do an investigation of the crime scene. Matthew Bogdanos is, by the way, he's a prosecutor in New York when he's not a counterterrorism expert. Um, and he, he asked to be assigned to, um, uh, to investigate the looting at the museum because he also has an MA in classical archaeology from Columbia. Uh, and he's quite a guy. So he's written a book I, would, I highly recommend uh, reading if, if, you, if you're interested. Anyway, so, so, so some, uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some pieces were returned, including that vase that I, that I mentioned before, um, and some cylinder seals as well. One of the uh, interesting little stories in this regard is, uh, is that uh, there was a, a head uh, 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 that was that was taken from the museum, and um, uh, an archaeologist was watching a TV show about uh, interior design, and they were panning around the living room of a of a millionaire who lived in Beirut. And the archaeologist noticed that the head that she had excavated was sitting on the mantelpiece, and so she notified Interpol, and they were uh, to get that piece back. But you know this this was very shortly after the museum was uh, was looted. Pieces showed up, in, by the way, in New York, in 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 Belgium, uh, in South America, in Tokyo. So so uh, a lot of these pieces almost immediately made their way out of the country through uh, through smuggling routes, and that tells you that these you know, there's uh, there's organized mafias that are ready to take advantage of these these problems. Seeing are thousands of artifacts, as I said before, including this one, which is only about so big, exquisite piece, and so if you if you spot that anywhere, let, let us know, because we're still we're still looking for it. Um, so as as the word uh, uh, went out that the museum had been looted, this is in the wake of the triumphalist uh, entry into Baghdad of the American forces. Uh, it was a big black eye for uh, the United States and. Uh, the defense secretary and the, the head of the Joint Chiefs did a press conference to take questions, uh, including questions about the looting of the museum. And the defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, he's famous for saying ridiculous things, um, uh, and, but you know, being a really smart guy who says really stupid things. Uh, and one of the things he said is, I keep seeing the same picture on TV over and over of the, some kid running out of a building with a vase in his hand. How many vases can there possibly be? Uh, and, and uh, you know, um, as if that solved the problem. Well, it, you know, it, it, it didn't. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, actually watching the press conference, immediately got on the phone and ordered, his, ordered the uh, uh, ambassador who was supposedly originally going to go into Iraq and take over the Ministry of Culture, uh, but had given it stuck in Kuwait uh, because, of course, the Pentagon and the State Department weren't talking to each other. Uh, and he ordered this guy to drive to Baghdad and hold a press conference at the museum saying, we're actually doing everything we can to secure the museum and get these artifacts back. So the story, about, a quick story about this guy, he, drive, he, he, gets in a, he gets in a car and he gets driven to, to Baghdad. By the way, he, 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 he had been appointed with about three weeks left before the invasion and was told that he was going to be in charge of the cultural ministry. And he asked the people in the State Department, um, uh, uh, who, who am I supposed to be dealing with? Because the plan was, uh, uh, the, the, the original plan was, we, we were just going to be there for 60 days, and 
uh, his job would be to sort of pay the head of the cultural ministry so that they could keep the ministry functioning. And then we'll, we'll pull out in 60 days. But they didn't know who the head of the ministry was in the State Department because that wasn't something they focused on. Anyway, he gets to Baghdad. He does, they, nobody knew where the, where, the, where the museum was either. Um, uh, and they didn't know where the cultural ministry was. And he, and he said, I was driving by a building and I saw these papers coming out of the window and smoke uh, and people pulling the doors off the hinges. And I looked up and, and the word said, Ministry of Culture. And he said, that's how I found the Ministry of Culture. Uh, so a, a complete fiasco, yeah? Um, okay, so, so after, after the museum, uh, it's important to note, the looting of the museum was a terrible tragedy. Probably, you know, the worst uh, loss of artifacts from, from, from a museum uh, maybe ever. One of, one of the worst. Uh, but uh, less reported, uh, but probably much worse than the looting of the museums, was the looting that occurred at the archaeological sites in Iraq following the looting of the museums over a period of uh, many years, I would say the worst of it, 2003 to 2006, um, during which um, uh, there was massive looting. So, so it started in May of 2003. Uh, UNESCO sent a, uh, a, a team out to, uh, to visit the sites to see what was going on because they had heard that, that uh, some sites were being attacked by looters. And this is what they saw. Now, that's not the way an archaeological site normally looks. It's this, these are, each of these is a hole. You can see how many there are, right? Okay. There, there were thousands of them on this site. Yeah? Uh, and, and the helicopter approaches, and the, and the guys on the ground start waving, saying, hey, you know, we've got some stuff for, for, uh, for you. Um, they land on the ground, and the guy, people are just sort of going about their business. You can see how spread out they are. Um, the military didn't have, you know, wasn't about to start driving them away. Um, they would find they found some nice artifacts. Uh, it's a beautiful vase sitting there, and uh, a guy with a with a gun, um, you know, making sure that nobody else takes it. Um, they opened up tombs and would find things inside them like this, and they would go up to the soldiers and offer them pieces for sale. The damage to the site was uh, sites has been was very difficult for the archaeologists to establish, in large part because the U.S. military did not want anybody to pay attention to this. It's a, it, it was another black eye, uh, and they didn't they refused to share um, satellite imagery. Uh, but eventually, uh, somebody was uh, one of the archaeologists got a grant for three hundred thousand dollars, which is what it cost at that point to buy satellite imagery, and she started counting the holes. Uh, and comparing before and after images, and um, you, she she discovered that the, right around the time of the invasion, actually before the invasion, when when Saddam moved his forces and pulled all the security people who would have otherwise been patrolling the sites away from them to sort of prepare for the invasion, that's when the looting started. A little bit right after the invasion, because I think people were, thought the Americans were actually going to secure the sites, but and when they didn't. They, uh, the looting just started in, in earnest in the summer of 2003. And it focused on, uh, she also, this, this, this analysis also showed that the sites that were the most hit were the sites that contained artifacts that were, were the most saleable on the international market. So uh, the uh, international forces sent in the Carabinieri, who are the Italian militarized police is the, is the country that does the best job protecting its archaeological heritage because they have a special force, uh, police force, whose job it is to uh, focus directly on the problem of protecting sites and museums from, from looting. And these are, these are very tough guys. They know how to deal with, with people uh, and, and they know the tricks uh, and so forth. And they were, they were relatively successful until they got attacked and uh, one of their uh, units was actually Several people were killed, and then they pulled away. The United States government chose not chose to disband the uh, Iraqis or, or antiquities police, um, and then it took it, it took well, it still hasn't been reconstituted yet. Uh, uh, as of 2010, uh, they they only had 500 out of the 5,000 people that they they had they they would have needed to sites. So the result of this is has been uh, that. 
uh, the, it, that thousands and thousands of holes have been dug all over Iraq, but mostly in the areas that have potentially a lot of artifacts. Uh, and if you compare the amount of uh, uh, territory that was, the number of holes that were dug before the war, archaeological sites, the, area, the areas of excavated before the war in 2003, from the beginning of Iraq's history to 2003, all the stuff that went into the museum, the museum had about 180,000 items. Right, so so uh, you can do a ballpark estimate. Three times as many as much area was l was dug up by looters between 2003 and 2006 as was dug up in the entire history of Iraq. So estimates are, you know, you, nobody knows for sure, but 400,000 uh, artifacts are, have come out of the ground in Iraq probably in the last since 2003. So that's three times as much, or two two to three times as much as the entire holdings of the Iraq Museum. Okay, so 15,000 items were stolen from the museum, but 400,000 items have been stolen since the war started because we didn't protect the archaeological sites. Now this is, a, this is all the more sad because before the 1990s, Iraq was actually one of the places that did the best job of protecting its archaeological sites. Uh, under Saddam, the, the state had an interest in uh, using antiquity for political purposes. So Saddam would, when he wanted to appeal to one ethnic group, he would say, the, the, you know, the Sumerians who were in your, who, who were the people who lived there before you were the great, were the originators of civilization. And then when another ethnic group would, would demand uh, some help from him, uh, he, would, he, would, he would use their, you know, what, the Assyrians, for example. So, so he, he, he did, he, he was very interested in, in using uh, archaeology for political purposes, and also comparing himself with, with the great rulers of the ancient past. So, there's a Saddam in profile here, and Nebuchadnezzar, who built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Next to him, he restored Babylon, and uh, actually, because Nebuchadnezzar had had his name uh, uh, put on all the bricks that are in Babylon, and they have the name of the king. Uh, Saddam, uh, when they restored Babylon, had Saddam's name put on the new bricks that they, they put in to, uh, to protect, uh, you know, to, to, to promote his, himself. But the sites were very well protected. Once the sanctions hit, it became more difficult to stop looting. And in response, the government instituted the death penalty for looters. They did catch one uh, group of looters uh, trying to smuggle this, this head out of the country, uh, which they, the looters had cut into four pieces. So in order to deter further looters, Saddam ordered these people to be executed on national television uh, by having their heads cut off and then having their heads cut into four pieces um, to, you know, to remind people that this is not something that you ought to do. Um, it didn't really have much of a deterrent effect. In contrast, what happened when the Americans came in was that, they, as I said before, they disbanded the Iraqi police force, but they, otherwise they did almost nothing except for one thing. They opened the museum for uh, one day in order to show that things were returning to normal. And they also put a, a base on, on top of uh, the ancient site of Babylon, which drove the archaeologists uh, uh, nuts. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't very good for the site. Okay, so the losses here to Iraq were substantial. Uh, it's, it's impossible to estimate how much these antiquities are worth on the market. Uh, as a whole, because we don't know what, what was looted. But we do know that one piece, uh, and this is a Mesopotamian piece, and that's about this tall, uh, was sold for $57 million, which is the highest uh, price ever paid for any statue. Uh, so, so, you know, th there, there was a lot of money out of Iraq uh, because of the looting. Um, there were also major political costs to the U.S. because of the looting of the museum. As I said, it happened right after the invasion at a time when the U.S. was trying to get other countries that hadn't supported the invasion to come in and help us with the re uh, reconstruction of Iraq. Uh, and this, uh, the looting of the museum gave several countries the, the excuse to put off coming in to help us for several months. And it was those two months that really allowed, uh, you know, for lawlessness to take, to take root uh, in, in Iraq and, um, and, 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 and arguably um, led to the, to the a disastrous after effects of the war. Um, it's also the case that the looters uh, were tied in with uh, 
Christian groups that were uh, anti-American uh, within Iraq. So, so we know that looting occurred in areas uh, that were controlled by Muqtada al-Sadr uh, at certain points when he was uh, uh, getting involved in um, uh, scuffles with, with other, other groups. We know that, uh, that terrorist groups as well have, have uh, traditionally used antiquities to, to, try to, um, um, uh, to try to raise money. Does anybody recognize who this person is? One of the 9-11 hijackers? Uh, anyway, he, he, when he was in Germany, he actually tried to sell some antiquities to a professor. And the professor said, why do you want to sell these? And he said, I want to buy a plane. This is a true story. So how, how could this happen? Was it a failure of leadership? Uh, was there a problem in the policy or structural deficiencies that caused this? So I mean, you sort of ask these questions about, about, um, uh, about the situation. I'm going to try to work through this pretty quickly. Um, so one of the problems was that uh, you couldn't get the attention uh, of the policymakers to get them to, to pay attention at all. And this is quite different from what happened in World War II when uh, when the people uh, in, in the cultural community were concerned about uh, what was going to happen when we invaded Europe, uh, they actually g had dinner with the head of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because he was on the board of the National Gallery, and they gave him a letter to give to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt told Eisenhower, you need to do something about this, and they did. Contrast that to what happened when one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago uh, tried to get in touch with people on to get them to to, to pay attention to the problem. He didn't make the connections to them, even though all three, of the, three of them had gone to the U of C or had connections to the University of Chicago. He did not, he couldn't figure out how to get to them. So, so those connections were just not made. Problematic was the fact that even if you wanted to contact people to try to say, you need to pay attention to what's going to happen after the shooting stops, the, the, the way that the planning was organized was designed to make it hard for anybody to find these people. They were hidden, these offices were hidden. So, you know, they were deep buried in the State Department, in the Pentagon, and the uniformed military. Uh, so uh, you, had to, you had to be an expert on, uh, on, on uh, how, how things worked inside the military to, to even know where to, where to go. What were military supposed to do? Well, there, there, there is a, uh, a convention that says the military is supposed to um, create a new strike list uh, and do a couple of other things. And, uh, and the military did, did all these things, um, except for the thing on the right, of course. Or, uh, but, but there's a problem with the international framework. That is to say, the international framework was, was written after World War II and was designed to prevent troops from looting during times of war. It wasn't designed to, to, to make troops stop civilians from looting. There, there's, no, there's no requirement that troops stop um, civilians from looting in, in, in the, uh, 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 the Hague Convention. So the result was the Pentagon did everything that it, was, it should have done under the Hague Convention, but it didn't, it didn't d develop any plans to protect the sites or the museum. Uh, Rumsfeld did have an idea for protecting the shrines. He said, we, we're going to be going in with some, some Muslim troops, so we should have the Muslim troops protect the shrines. Uh, but of course, the Muslim troops that we were going in with were, were Sunni and the shrines were Shiite. So that, that would have been a really, a really bad idea. Um, but at least he was thinking. Um, what would it have taken to secure the sites? Well, as I said before, if, we, if the United States had had its own militarized police, like the Carabinieri, we might have been able to use them. Um, but we didn't have anything like that. If we had, if we had, had specialized uh, equipment and technology, we might have been able to, to deploy that. But we didn't, we didn't have. These are all kind of science fiction uh, scenarios. I'm, I'm, uh, that were developed by, we had a meeting about this where we asked security experts, well, what could you do if you wanted to protect the museum? And one of the things is you could go around with this sticky foam that they, they have and you could spray it on the window so anybody who would try to get in would get stuck on it. And then the last thing the guy came up with was to uh, go to the sites and drop um, a reptile, you know, so reptile pheromones so that you'd get millions of scorpions um, coming onto the sites and nobody would want to dig on those sites if you had millions of scorpions. So, you know. Thinking, right? So then you have to ask, well, why, why don't we have people who, are, who, who deal with these kinds of things? And the answer to that is a deeper is structural problem with the way the US military is organized. We were designed to fight, the, fight, uh, fight a nuclear war with the Soviets. And so 
part of NATO. So we're, our military is designed to drive the Soviets back. We're supposed to go, go in and then the people who do have these units, the Italians, the French, the Spanish, they, they're coming in after us to sweep up. That's why we didn't have available. So we couldn't have done anything even if we had wanted to, um, unless we had called on these other countries, which many of whom were not working with. It's also the case that, that the non-military agents of the United States were not, were not uh, ready for this because they're not designed to do this. They work on import-export issues. The State Department was also not ready for this. They had a group called the Future of Iraq Project that, was, that met before the war and tried to develop a whole set of plans for post-war Iraq, for the justice sector, for the health care, for education. 16 different groups, working groups. Nobody thought of culture. And there, so there was no working group on, on, on culture. And these were exiles from, from Iraq. So, um, uh, they, uh, so, so they never, uh, finally somebody asked them, was there going to be a group? And they, they met once and they never uh, uh, met again and the war started, it was over. Last but not least, you want to think, what other groups are there that might have you know, sort of had an impact on policy outside the government? There are heritage organizations and international uh, governmental organizations like UNESCO that, that have a stake in cultural heritage. They were shut out by the United States. Um, and the cultural NGOs, uh, the Archaeological Institute of America and other groups did not, did not even try to get involved. So they were really in that, there are other, you know, besides, besides the people that care about protecting archaeological heritage, there are the people that care about collecting archaeological heritage. The collectors, they actually uh, did succeed in getting a meeting at the Pentagon and a meeting with people up uh, you know, high in the hierarchy in the Bush administration. So, so uh, they, they, they got their voice heard. Um, and, but their main interest was in trying to make sure that after the war they were going to be allowed to collect antiquities from Iraq, that Iraq would open up its trade with the rest of the world because Iraq did not allow uh, most of its artifacts to leave the country. So they were really interested in lobbying you know, the, the Bush administration to say, when you write the constitution for Iraq, make sure that you change this so that we can, we can actually start buying these things. Okay, so after, after, the, after the fiasco, uh, uh, we, we, we got together a group of uh, all the people that, in, that should have been in, done something but didn't and people that tried to do something but couldn't and we had a big meeting and, uh, uh, and we produced a set of recommendations uh, in the culture, on, uh, sorry, Antiquities Under Siege book. Um, uh, and, and these lessons actually were learned by the United States military. So one of the things I'm proudest of is the fact that the, the, the military now has a command in its war plans that says secure cultural sites. So never again will we go into a country and not do that because that's, this is the Bible for, for the military planners. And that wasn't there before and I think we got it in there because we, we kept putting pressure on them. Um, there's now an awareness of the need to develop these military policing units, but it's not clear whether that, that's going to happen. Um, the Department of Defense actually uh, started doing some things, uh, including creating packs of cars to raise cultural awareness among troops. Um, and inside the United States, a, a um, organization called the Blue Shield uh, was formed. These are um, like the Red Cross, but for cultural protection. I don't know if there's a Blue Shield for China. Uh, if anybody knows, I'd be interested in knowing. Um, but these, the, the, if they're, they're, they're supposed to deal with the cultural disasters and, and work with the military to come in. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going very quickly, but I'm, I'm going to try to wrap it up uh, as fast. Unfortunately, one of the lessons that hasn't been learned, um, I think, and this is a lesson that archaeologists uh, have a hard time learning, uh, which is, is just because you're interested in conserving a site doesn't mean that you're good at securing a site and protecting it from people who have guns. Right? So the archaeologists tend to think the, s the way we should solve this problem is by spending more money to train the Iraqis. And so we, we spend a lot of money on con uh, bringing archaeologists over from Iraq and conservators, training them in conservation methods. In the meantime, their sites are being looted. Right? So millions of dollars bringing archaeologists over, that money probably would have been better spent hiring local guards um, uh, uh, which uh, still haven't been, been done. Um, but the State Department didn't really want to know that, that looting was still going on. The talking game was that everything was returning to normal. And so uh, things have gotten a little bit better, but there's still a lot of looting 
uh, even now in Iraq. So the situation was never really resolved. And I blame that on the State Department. Okay, so let me quickly turn to Egypt and, and Libya. Um, so uh, quick, a quick, some quick background on Egypt. Um, uh, before the revolution, Egypt uh, was, of course, a tourist mecca, uh, a tourist, uh, major tourist destination, uh, a, a very large bureaucracy and, uh, in the heritage sector. And it was dominated by one person who was known as the pharaoh of antiquities, this guy, Zahi Hawass, he had his own National Geographic TV show. Um, uh, uh, and and he, was, he, he was a firebrand, um, but he, he was also a big promoter of archaeology in, in Egypt, made the Egyptians aware of their heritage. And one of the ways he, 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 he got them interested was by, by uh, drumming up um, uh, 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 nationalistic uh, sentiment in favor of restitution, that is, bringing back artifacts that had been stolen, uh, uh, illegally exported from, from Egypt. And in fact, uh, a year before the, nine months before the, the, uh, the revolution, he held a major conference in Cairo where he brought together heads of countries from around the world, all of whom wanted their stuff back. The Chinese wanted stuff back from, from uh, the, the, um, the Summer Palace. Um, the, uh, the Mexicans wanted something back. The, Italians, the Greeks, and they all, uh, they had a big, big conference and talked about, about this. So that was the issue that they were mainly cons con uh, uh, concerned about. Uh, somehow that picture didn't come up. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so these are, these are the things that he, that he was interested in. Um, it, one of the things that wasn't a priority uh, was uh, museum security. So we, you know, after, this, after this big conference, there were, the, uh, Van Gogh was stolen from, from a museum and another museum had something stolen from it, uh, and, and the response was, "Well, we'll put in new security systems, but they were not um, actually, you know, nothing actually really happened." In in the in the Cairo Museum, when the when the break-in did occur, the security cameras were apparently not not working inside the museum, um, and we also know that there were only four police uh, from the tourist police at, at the side of the break-in, right? And we know that the security cameras that are normally uh, uh, focused on the walls of the museum to make sure nobody climbs over them, were taken over by the by the security forces, Egyptian security forces, and turned so that they could watch the crowds out in the street, right? So not not so they, because they were worried that there was going to be you know a, a big riot, um, uh, and they wanted to be able to catch people. So the scene here is that you know this is the after the Tunisian Revolution. There's a lot of unrest. Uh, there have been demonstrations in Tahrir Square, which is the big square, it's the Tiananmen Square uh, of Egypt, and the museum is on one, one side of that. The museum is not, not just near where the action is, it's on the right in the middle of where the action is. In fact, there's a, a building right next to the museum, which is where the interior ministry, the bad guys, have their building. So on Wednesday, the, the, that museum is, um, I mean, sorry, that building is set on fire. So here you can see the museum and the black smoke right next to it. They were worried that the museum was going to catch fire. This is on Wednesday. So you would think that, that if I was running, if I was Zahi Hawass, I would have, I would have I called all my people and said, I, you know, get, get over to the museum, get inside the museum. I want everybody, all hands on deck. I want everybody, I want to stop, you know, I, 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 I want to make sure nothing else can happen. So I think everybody, sh the opposite happened. Nobody showed up at the museum. He told people not not to, not, to, not to show up. The employees stayed away. He himself did not go to the museum. Remember I told you that in Iraq, the, the museum director you know, holed, holed up in the museum along with the head of the, of the uh, antiquities ministry. And they, everybody else left, but they stayed because they were the people who were, who were in charge. Hawass did not show up at the museum. As I said, the, the military and the security forces took over. So a few people, so at, at one point there was a, there was a, uh, the mob, uh, a mob outside the museum. People climbed over the wall and they attacked a, get, a, a brand new building that many people think they thought was the museum, but it was actually the gift shop and that was completely ransacked. But nobody, nobody got into the museum except for four people who climbed up uh, in, and went down through a skylight um, and, uh, and took a few items out of the museum, although a couple of them were, were very important. One of the things that happened was Egyptian citizens spontaneously formed a human chain once they, they, knew, they realized that the museum was being looted and they, 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 they prevented uh, people from coming in. And 
you know, the, the people who were interviewed who did this said that they didn't want, they didn't want Cairo to be another uh, Baghdad. So, so there's clearly lessons learned by, by citizens about what you need to do in the case of an emergency. And it's a very, very moving thing that, they, that these people did this. Um, so the question of, about you know, wh what is the meaning of the looting of the museum question. Uh, there, are, there are a number of suspicious things about it. Very unlike the Iraq Museum where, where thousands of people went through the museum, this is four people. Um, and uh, Hawass uh, claimed that it was just amateurs. But uh, people in the crowd who, who captured some of the looters had interior ministry ideas on them. If they're amateurs, they were also amateurs that also uh, worked for the security forces, at least some of them. Um, another mi mysterious thing is that uh, one of the museum employees came into the museum one day and said, I was going to work and I, I, stop I stopped in a subway, I sat down for a minute, and I noticed there was a bag next to me, and I opened up the bag, and inside the bag there was this, I found one of the artifacts from the museum. Surprise. Um, so hard to believe, yeah. Um, so uh, after the museum, what happened? Well, the country was you know, sliding into, into chaos. The museum was looted in part because the security forces had withdrawn from, you know, from, from controlling the crowds. But Hawass and, and, and the government didn't want to admit that things were wrong. And so they kept saying, well, no, nothing, everything is under control. Only, you know, this is uh, just a, a, an unfortunate, you know, small security breach. Meanwhile, reports started coming in that um, looting was starting on archaeological sites and that, the, that storerooms that, that, that uh, held artifacts that had been dug up by earlier expeditions. So archaeologists would come in and dig up the site, and then they would, they would build a store storehouse and put the stuff in a storehouse, and it would stay there for 20, 30, 30 years. The Metropolitan Museum had one, uh, and, and these were being broken into by, by, uh, by mobs that were coming and driving off uh, the guards there. Um, finally, in the middle of March, Hawass uh, you know, t changed his tune from saying everything is okay to saying the military is not doing anything, I'm going to quit. Then he quit, and, they, and he, uh, uh, he got them to get him to come back in exchange for promises to uh, or arm his guards and protect the sites. Uh, but uh, you know, eventually he was forced to resign. Uh, the military uh, and the security forces have never really recovered, even now, a year after. And the result of looting going on uh, on these sites. So you, you, here's a before and after picture. That, that you know makes clear how how this is occurring. You can see all these brand new holes in the front here. There are pictures like this coming out of uh, body parts that are you know the, the, these guys would, will, will rip out the mummies and just unfurl them, looking for the amulet or whatever is buried is buried with the body. And and so you come across these sites and there are these bones all over the place, uh, uh, and they're kind of dramatic pictures, right? So lesson number one for Egypt is. Uh, plan to provide your own security. Don't don't depend on the arms of others, um, uh, as as Machiavelli once said. Said you know, it's best best to depend on your own arms uh, rather than the arms of others. Second lesson is you can't expect that uh, just because people make a living from from heritage uh, and, and therefore know what heritage is, that that's going to prevent them from uh, that's going to stop all the looting from occurring in a country when the police disappear. Um, there are a number of archaeologists who believe that all we need to do is have public education campaigns, and, one, uh, and, and in fact, what we really need to do is to convince the people that it's in their, the locals that it's in their self-interest to protect the sites because that's where the revenue comes from. Uh, tourist revenue uh, is what keeps their families going, and so the market can solve the problem. Uh, uh, but the reality is that that even in a place like Egypt, which where, where everybody knows how important the tourism is for the economy, it didn't, it hasn't prevented. Um, um, looting from occurring. Third lesson, uh, if, you, if, if the public is, is engaged, uh, they can make a difference in the short run. Right? They, can, they, they can stand up against people who are, who are, who are trying to do bad things in, in moments of crisis. Lesson number four is that it's not enough just to, to have these ad hoc uh, uh, responses on the part of the public. 
What we really need is to have uh, the public organize itself uh, and advocate uh, and put pressure on the government. It needs to form permanent interest groups that can um, make the case for why something should be protected and, 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 and shame the government or, or else develop its own capa quick capacity to go out and you know, mobilize a citizenry uh, to, that, can, that can take care of these things. So one of the interesting things that's happening now is in G Egypt is that we are seeing the development of these non-governmental organizations. And I'm the, here are some of them that are listed on the right. These are all new, and they're, uh, it's a very, a very promising development uh, to see civil society um, uh, becoming engaged in this, in this action. The uh, fifth lesson is that it's, uh, s these groups need the help of other countries who can provide this can put pressure on uh, through, their, through their own governments, on the Egyptian government, uh, and can help out in various ways. Uh, and so we're seeing this happening in Egypt in the uh, online community. These are some, some Facebook groups if you're interested in, uh, in, in finding out how, you know, what conversations are occurring and strategizing and so forth. Okay. Let me quickly turn, last but not least, to Libya. Libya was one of those countries that, uh, that, that had a wish list for, uh, uh, for objects to be returned. Uh, this is in the British Museum, a uh, classical Roman site of Cyrene. Libya, by the way, is, is important archaeologically in part because it has major Greco-Roman sites. So even though it's in North Africa, that was a, that was a, a major area of, of, of Greco-Roman civilization. Under Gaddafi's reign, unlike Saddam, Gaddafi did not care about the classical sites in his, in his country. He was trying to redefine Libyan identity as African identity and, and not tied to the West. So he basically starved the antiquities ministry, the archaeologists. There was very little tourism. They weren't interested in bringing tourists in. Uh, but, so that was, that was not good for the archaeologists, but on the other hand, because because Gaddafi was such a tough guy, um, uh, uh, there, was, there was very little looting um, during, during the time when he was firmly in power. But as, as his, his hold on power began to unravel, uh, archaeologists who were, who were worried about what was going to happen and had learned the lessons of both Iraq and Cairo started doing things. So each, in, each of these cases we're seeing a learning, a learning curve going on, right? So people are responding to what happened and, and saying, oh, we won't let this happen to us now. So the site coordinates were submitted. Um, an archaeologist at this point, uh, one, one of the key Libyan archaeologists in, in exile in London, um, reached out to, uh, to, through family members and these you know, tribal networks that he allowed him to get in touch with rebel leaders. And they developed these plans to have a militia group from the rebels Take over, you know, control over the over the over the museum when the when the regime fell, um, and in fact, this was clearly, you know, uh, I mean, he says, "I saw the scenes in Cairo. Uh, I took that as a model, right? So, you know, I've got to, I've got to get the people to make sure this is protected before it happens." So this is important. We're we're seeing we're seeing um, uh, an iterative process where people are 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 are, um, are, are, are more proactive each time, right? So when the Qaddafi fell. Um, the archaeologists called his relatives and they, uh, and they secured the museum. Meanwhile, the people in the museum hid, hid the valuable objects. Um, it, was, it was very uncertain whether the major sites were safe. NATO did not bomb a single site. I mean, NATO has had a very good rap record in general in terms of um, loading up these site coordinates and then not hitting them. Um, there was very little damage even on the uh, sites that Gaddafi's troops used for target practice. In the east of Libya, which is in the desert area, and, you know, on the border with Egypt, it's, uh, there was less um, uh, things. Things turned out less well. Um, there was a, a, tre a treasure that was that had been put into a museum vault, and uh, that that was attacked. Uh, the, the the museum, uh, sorry, the, not a museum, a bank vault, and the bank was um, broken into, and then they drilled this hole in the, and and stole this um, sack of coins, basically. And part of the reason that was allowed to occur was that in Egypt and the West, there are these gangs that are uh, uh, associated with the antiquities trade there and that had been gaining force because of the Egyptian revolution uh, as well, and they were, they were ready to pounce. So one of the lessons here is that it's possible to, to successfully protect your, 
your, your uh, sites if, if you improvise properly. Okay. So one of the things that happened was at the major site, they actually welded the doors of the storeroom shut, which they didn't do in Egypt. They just locked them. So that was another case where they learned from what had gone wrong in a previous uh, case. Another interesting thing that they did was they invited local shepherd, uh, shepherds to actually bring their flocks onto the, onto the site, something that archaeologists would normally think of as a really bad thing to do. Is to, you, don't want your anim you don't want animals grazing on your archaeological sites. Uh, but in this case, it turned out to be a good thing because they, they enlisted them to, to, to be monitors. While, and they said, you can, you can graze, but you have to let us know if anything happens. And, and these guys did report, and then they were able to bring out uh, where, where needed. Um, they also went to the, some of Qaddafi's militia and persuaded them that it would be in their interest to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to switch sides and actually you know, just come and protect the sites. Uh, and so they, they, that, that, that turned out to be successful as well. There were also um, personal uh, uh, commitments, as in Iraq, of uh, brave uh, antiquities uh, officials who um, uh, put their lives on the line. One guy got beaten unconscious um, uh, in, in the course of it. I just want to end by uh, saying a, a word about Syria. We're in the middle of this right now. It's the worst uh, uh, situation that we've experienced, not, not because of looting, although there's a lot of looting going on, but because the fighting is actually occurring uh, in a civil war on these sites. So um, there, there's been quite a lot of um, uh, terrible things going on there, and I, I wanted to end by just um, playing um, playing you the uh, this one. How do I get this to go full screen? Uh, let's go full screen. So, th so th this is a uh, uh, a um, kind of a blurry image of a, a tank firing, and then the camera uh, shows that it's it's hit this colonnade. Uh, uh, of Roman columns, it's the longest, uh, the longest existing uh, in column colonnade in the in, in the world, uh, and so there, there was fighting going on between the troops and the and the, uh, uh, the rebels, and and uh, archaeological sites are the um, are the victim of of that. Um, so uh, uh, with that, I, I I think I'll I'll, I'll conclude, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.